Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to the first ever Sommelier Corner tasting. Uh, we haven't done this before, but I think it's something that I would love to bring to bear in the future articles. Uh, that way you can see how I go through tasting the grid, as well as maybe uh, you can do some blind tasting of your own in the future. Now, I did just reference the grid. I use the one from the Court of Master Sommeliers. That's this here. I'll have a link in the article. Uh, today we're just going to go through the white wine, because uh, we're featuring a white wine, obviously. So a couple of things with tasting a wine. Uh, first off, you want to make sure that your glass is clean and polished. Uh, that's very important. It can affect the smells. It can affect the clarity when you're checking your color, things like that. Uh, so I always like to polish my own glass right before I do a tasting. Additionally, um, with this particular wine, we're going to talk about a couple of different things uh, that I think are good to focus on in general. Okay, so. First off, we are trying a Riesling. It is JJ Prum, Joe Joss Prum, 2017, Grocker Himmelreich. It is Spätlese, I'm sorry, Spätlese. Uh, that is going to be on the leaner side, not quite as sweet as they could be, uh, but it is the second from the bottom. So it's a little more sweet from their Cabinet wine, but not nearly as sweet as when you're getting up to Auslese and Chockenbaren Auslese. Um, that said, this you know, Riesling is very well known for having a great acid. Uh, so the sweetness is actually a good thing because it can bring it back to earth. So it's not just a very searing, you know, mouth puckering type of wine. Uh, I literally just opened this bottle. It's been refrigerated all night. Uh, so it might be a little cold, but we're going to go ahead and get started here. Okay. So on your grid, the first thing is color. Uh, for the certified, you don't have to be, uh, too extra when you're talking about the color. They've given you three different choices, straw color, yellow, or gold. Uh, and you know, so Chardonnays, things with age, you'll often see more of a gold. Uh, the fun thing about white wine is the longer that it ages, the darker that it gets. And it's completely opposite with red wine. The longer that the red wine ages, the lighter that it gets. So that's always a great rule of thumb. You can use it a little bit for age, but that's not what we're doing here today. So. Let's take a look. I like to just take my grid, a nice white sheet, flip it over, and then I hold it up over it. Now this one, you know, it's, it's got a very clear rim, almost silver on the edges, but when you look deep into the center of the glass, it's definitely got a uh, yellow color. It's definitely a little darker than straw, but nowhere near a gold today. So that would be my first thing that I'm gonna check off on the grid here. We're gonna go with yellow. Now, kind of referencing the grid again, uh, you're going to have a lot of different check boxes that you're going through. And, you know, I already know what this wine is, so the grid is generally when you're doing a blind tasting so you can help narrow down your options. That said, when talking about Riesling, what's often tasted as a comparable or a challenge, if you will, you have Riesling, Chenin Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc, and then Gewürztraminer will actually get in there as well. Uh, and Gruner Veltliner from Austria is another good option. Uh, the last two, the Gewürztraminer, goes great as a comparison when you're taking Gewürztraminer against a sweet style Riesling because they both have a similar body, but your acid is going to be a bit higher, much higher on your Riesling. So those are things that you're looking for. I would say when tasting a white wine, structure is going to be one of the most important things to pay attention to. So what is the acid like? You know, how dry is it? And a lot of people like to use that word. Uh, what does it have any sugar? And then, you know, what, what kind of um, underlying notes are you getting? Because if it's got a bigger body, you're probably moving away from something like a Sauvignon Blanc, for example. So let's go on to the next step, which we're going to start smelling and tasting the wine. Now, in the fruit character, which is the next section, it has apple and pear, yes or no. Citrus, yes or no. Stone fruit, yes or no. Tropical, yes or no. Then you have condition, fruit condition on the nose as well as on the palate. So I'm going to go through this quickly because I don't want to take too much of your time today. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, this, uh, it is pretty... You know, you can keep going because the first thing I got on that was actually flowers. So I'm going to go ahead and go down to the non-fruit and go ahead. Those are all yes and no's as well. So I'm going to go towards the bottom here. And you have inorganic earth and organic earth. I'm going to actually say yes to both of those because I got a little bit of like a smoky gunflint there. So 
back to it. Let me, I'll start announcing what I smell as I go. So, got that smoky gunflint, got honeysuckle, a little bit of lavender. Kind of a, a yeast. Um, ooh, what was that at the end? Maybe even a little herbal character, but like a fresh mowed grass kind of thing, right? Um, so for apple and pear on the fruit, no, no apple and pear on that. For citrus, yes, I got lots of citrus. Oh yeah, it's like tangerine, blood orange, grapefruit, actually, some nice white grapefruit on that. Now, the reason we switched the glass, if you didn't know, uh, when you do that, it allows oxygen to interact with the wine and the molecular structure, and it releases ethers. And that's what actually creates your bouquet and your aroma. So when you see people switching the glass and giving a smell, it's because they're trying to open it up and make those smells happen. Lots of citrus. I mean, it's just never ending. I also got stone fruit and tropical on that because I got a little bit of uh, honeydew, some peaches, and then even some like a uh, banana in there at the end. Uh, fruit condition. Okay. So the fruit can, I still haven't tasted it. You see, um, I'm, I like to start with the nose and get through as much as I can, and then I'll taste it. And that's more of a confirmation than, uh, you know, searching because the taste is, uh, going to be very similar usually to the nose with a couple differences. So on the fruit condition, Hmm, that one's tough. On the nose, I, I'm between tart and ripe, but I'm gonna go towards ripe, um, just because it does, it's a very bright fruit character. It's definitely not overripe or jammy, it's not baked or dried, and I'm sorry that I don't have a sheet here for you to reference, but there is a link within the article. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and go with ripe on the fruit condition for the nose. Now for the palate, my first taste. Usually you taste and spit, you know, all that. I'm not gonna have you watching me spit. That's gross. I know you don't want to see that. So I'll just take baby sips and, you know, make sure to enjoy. Mmm. <laughs> yeah, definitely ripe. Maybe tart. I, I don't... You're allowed to check too, so I'm going to go tart to ripe on the palate. Now, you saw how I uh, did that. So the reason people do that is to do the same thing as what I was doing when I was swishing it in the glass. Uh, when you switch it in the glass, you let oxygen in. When you're doing that, you're letting oxygen in. So the flavors also kind of aerate around in your mouth and you can get a better feel. Secondary use for that, it is gross, I know. But secondary use is for wines, uh, for alcohol, trying to determine how high the alcohol is. When you do that, if it's a higher alcohol wine, it's a little hot. Uh, and when it's a lower alcohol wine, it's not. So... Uh, one thing to note that I, you know, since I just had my first sip, so two things. One, um, my mouth is still watering after I just took that sip, which means it does have good acid. Because when you salivate, you have acid. When you feel it on your gums, that's tannin. Now, obviously, in white wine, you don't have tannin, or do you? Now, white wine's tannins are phenolic bitterness, and that's essentially just from skin contact. You get it a lot in Pinot Grigio, as well as Vignet. And so when you, you know, you'll still get that astringent feeling, uh, and that is essentially white tannin. Uh, hopefully that's something new for you. It took me a while to really pick up on that. So as we're going down on the non-fruit characters, floral, oh yeah. Herbal, you know, I got that like grassiness at first, but really is kind of gone. Yeah, not, not much herbal character. I, I, you know, for these yes or no's, I would like to make sure that it's very obvious, you know, because if it's readily apparent is when you know that it's a true herbal note. So I'm going to go no on that. No on the vegetal, because I wasn't getting any type of vegetal notes. Now, botrytis. Ah, botrytis. Gingered, honeyed, and waxy. So botrytis is a noble rot. It affects grapes in Bordeaux, as well as in uh, Germany and many other places. But what it does is it essentially dehydrates the grape. Uh, this is useful when you're making a sweet wine, because it takes all the water out, and so all that you're left with is sugar. Uh, so great, obviously they use that for, um, Sautern over in Bordeaux to make their Sauvignon Blanc Semillon dessert wine that is out of this world. And then additionally for, uh, Riesling, they do have Botrytis, but they also do Eisvine where they, is a Botrytis affected grape 
they leave it on the vine and then that vine actually gets frozen and that's when they harvest the grapes and it comes out like molasses. It's awesome. So that's a definite yes. I definitely got ginger, lots of honey in there, like even a honeycomb, a honeysuckle, all of that uh, going there. So definitely a yes on that. Oxidative and nutty. That one's tough because I get like a little bit of a brioche, a little bit of a Lee's type of character, um, but not, it's not feeling overly oxidative. Yeah, it's light and bright. It doesn't feel like it's, you know, got that nutty character. So we're going to go no on that. Now, I just said Lee's, doughy, baked bread, yeasty. I definitely feel like that's there. I'm going to reassess because the Botrytis and the Lee's can interact very similarly. So they can kind of trick you. So I'm going to revisit that. Yeah, see, it's a good idea to revisit and double check yourself as you're going because Lee's means doughy, baked bread, yeasty. I'm honestly not getting those notes, but the honeyed, waxy character made me think that I was. You know what's great with Lee's? Champagne. You get brioche, you get bread, especially in aged champagne. So those have great Lee's if you're looking for that sensation and what that's like. Definitely pop open something like a Vouv and smell it a little bit, taste it, look for a doughy yeast is the best word for it um, because that's what they do is it just sits in the bottle and it gets written. See, I'm still salivating, by the way, as I'm talking. Um, so we're going to go no there. It is not buttery or creamy. That one's there. If you ever check that, go ahead and start leaning towards Chardonnay. There's not too many other options when you're buttery and creamy. Promise. Uh, we already talked about organic earth with wet leaves and mushrooms. I got a little flowers. That's actually what I'm talking about with organic earth in this note. Uh, so I am going to check yes on that. Uh, and then or inorganic earth is the, the soil, right? So in Germany, most Riesling is grown on slate soil. Blue slate, red slate, uh, gray slate. There's all kinds. And they actually truly, I know it's weird, but they truly do affect how the wine tastes. This one's more of a gray blue um, slate, and the way you really get it is on the palate. It's a you know, it's crazy. We call it minerality. It's hard to taste minerality, but once you do, you can't really deny its existence. So in this sense, I definitely get some minerality, but I would like to revisit on what level. Oh yeah, it's almost like a, a grindy character on the tongue. It's interesting, it's hard to describe. The word we use in the psalm world is minerality. It's a weird one, but it does kind of describe, it really does describe what the sensation is. Now it's asking about new oak is the final question, uh, in non-fruit characters at least. So for new oak, you would usually get some vanilla, some baking spices, something like that. I get none of that on this. I do get a little bit of smoke, which it mentions, but uh, not to the sense that I would think that it was new oak. Maybe neutral, but maybe not. So I'm gonna go with no, because it's not pronounced over there. Now for structure, we've talked a little bit about this as we were going. Uh, bitter and phenolic, no, this doesn't have any of that. Uh, that would be astringent up on your gums, as I said earlier. Um, as far as sweetness, now, dry means bone dry. It means, you know, that you're not going to have any type of sweetness. Uh, this one is definitely more than dry. Off dry means a little touch of sweetness. And then medium sweet is even more than that. Now, it used to just be actually dry and off dry, by the way. Uh, so I personally lean towards off dry on this for the sweetness um, because it does have some sugar. It's very detectable but it's not like, it, you know, it coats the mouth a little, but it doesn't, you know, I don't know, it's not mo like molasses. It's not super viscous. It's got a little bit, but it's really just more rounded. Uh, so I'm going to go with off dry on that. Could be wrong. I don't know. This is still technically um, very subjective when you're doing the tasting. The objective part is when you analyze, and I kind of, you know, it's called a grid. So if we didn't have these questions, I would think of it in an Excel spreadsheet. So go down, go across, double check, double check. And that's what I did when I actually got certified is I was 
dead certain that this wine was a Pinot Noir and I was calling it from France the whole time. Uh, at the end, I changed my mind because I was crossing, checking my grid and I had way more fruit character than non-fruit character. And so that meant it was more likely to be a new world wine than an old world wine like France. I went to Oregon and I did pass, so there's that. Uh, so acid, we talked about that a little bit while we were going through it. I mean, I'm just gonna go straight to high. My mouth has been watering the entire time that we've been, I've been talking here with you. Uh, so definitely gonna go high acid. Now when you're going high acid, you've definitely eliminated several other options just by feeling like it's a high acid. So that's one to always double check. But the ones that go with high acid in this circumstance would be Chenin Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc, and Riesling are your big three. Uh, Albarino comes to mind as well uh, out of Spain. But those are your ones that always have, and they're more of a, you know, almost high acid. But all of them are, are lean towards the higher side on acid. You're, all, you're salivating as you're drinking it. The other ones generally have a more tart fruit character as well. Alcohol. So we're, I'm going to do that gross little thing real quick. Sorry about that. So not very hot at all. I'm going to go with low, low alcohol. Um, in general, Rieslings are going to have lower alcohol because uh, they're just more sugar. And so, you know, that's, that's another way, you know, when you have high acid and low alcohol, man, you might as well put a pin in it and just double check yourself because it's pretty likely that you're dealing with a Riesling. So at the bottom, it actually has fill-ins for the primary grape on this particular grid because I'm not actually being tested. If you were taking a test, they would fill in six different options, including the option that is the grape. Uh, so I'm just going to write Riesling. We already know it's Riesling. As I said, this is usually done for a blind tasting. Now for New World and Old World, um, I just mentioned this, right? So for the New World wines, they're usually going to have more fruit character. So what well, that means isn't that it doesn't have other characteristics, it's just that the fruit character is the thing that you get first uh, in most situations. And then old world wine, you generally will get the non-fruit characters first. And so everything about that, uh, you know, in this instance, the honeysuckle, the honeyed and waxiness, uh, the minerality that I mentioned, uh, the lavender, I got... Um, the little jasmine in there. So, you know, mostly I was talking, initially I was talking about a lot non-fruit characters. So in that instance, then I'm going to go ahead and lean old world because I was talking more about non-fruit most of the time throughout this conversation. Additionally, when you look over, you have, um, you know, four boxes checked for non-fruit, which isn't a lot, but it is enough to, you know, make you be looking that you got a lot of non-fruit first. And I even, if you recall, at the beginning of this video, the very first thing I did was go down to non-fruit and check inorganic and organic earth because that's what I got first. So definitely going to go with the old world. And it says explain why. So non-fruit character first. Now the type of climate. Cool, moderate, warm. Uh, this is going to get increasingly difficult with global warming, I promise. But uh, a cool climate usually means a high acid. And... So I lean towards cool automatic because I have the high acid quality. Uh, other things to promote this is the fact that I have a tart to ripe fruit character. Uh, so if it was overripe, then you can lean into the warmth, right? Because that means it's getting a lot of sun, the, berry, the grapes are getting very ripe, uh, things like that. So I'm gonna still go with cool. Once again, it's kind of cheating. I know what the wine is. But I'm going through the grid so that you can have an understanding of how we would approach this if we were doing this blind. Now, this one, the general age, is always super tricky because um, it's just really difficult to tell. And great, we're lucky. We get general age. So one to two, three to four, or over five years. Now, this wine, you know, if you look at the color, there's nothing about it to indicate that it's an older wine. You know, uh, everything is very bright and colorful. There's no uh, rim variance as you go in it starts clear and gets darker and more yellow as you go into the glass so you know i would actually on this wine i would very likely go one to two years off the bat because of the color on the body as well very light very bright not super over the top and so there's a lot a uh, lot of reasons to go with the you know younger wine there now with sweetness because this one does have some sweetness that can 
mask the effects of age, if you will. Uh, really, as a wine, as a sweet wine ages, it gets even more and more sweeter because it becomes more. That was a very bad verbiage. Uh, it gets more. No, it gets sweeter and sweeter as time goes on, um, and so as a result of that, it's going to get darker in color, a little bit more molassesy. So you know, if the, I've had a Sauterne that was from 1969. It was black black like molasses and just very viscous and it was like having syrup it was amazing though uh so i would i would probably go one to two years on this and i would be wrong because this is six years old now um and so you know i would i would never guess five plus years on this particular wine it's very bright it's very very you know it feels young on the palate however this you know that's one of the beauties of riesling uh i can never remember where i read this but i will always remember the quote in general uh, but it was saying that Riesling is a red wine masquerading as a white wine. And that really goes to speak to its ageability. Uh, there's some Riesling wines that are over 100 years that drink phenomenal right now. Um, even this one, based on most experts, they're saying that you should be drinking this in another four years. So that was a 10-year wine before the experts are recommending to drink it. And that just shows how far a good Riesling can go. Um, yeah, so I really hope you've enjoyed this tasting. I know I've enjoyed it. Uh, that was actually a lot of fun talking about the wine. Um, and I apologize if I talk too fast. I didn't want to take too much of your time, but it looks like I might have. Um, anyhow, thank you so much for tuning in. If you have any questions or you're ever looking for a wine recommendation, feel free to shoot me a text or email. I'm happy to make any recommendations, whether it's for you, for a gift, for a dinner party. Doesn't matter. I love talking about wine. I love talking about real estate. And I love helping people. So that's why we're all here. And I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this video with me today. Thank you so much.